Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Shirtless Plantain Show, the soccer edition. This is your host, Mitch. I'm here as always with Mateus. Hi, Mateus. How are you? Man, my back seized up, so that's cool. I love being 25. Um, I'm good. <laughs> 25. Fuck you. Yeah. What, what an Fuck old, you. old man. <laughs> I feel like it. I'm going to eject myself from this podcast. Uh, uh, Emily's also here, repping Barcelona. Hi, Emily. How are you? You know, I'm not really a fan, but, you know. Um, I mean, I also have a Barcelona jersey, despite the fact that I'm not a Barcelona fan. It's we aesthetic. just collect. We just collect. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to apologize because we were supposed to record yesterday, but I got stuck in an event at hard rock uh stadium since the Copa yeah. america so they had to pry me out of there so i'm back <laughs> how, mu- how much was bail more than a ticket to Copa america so it didn't really work out well i mean uh i heard that the the the, the leader of the colombian football federation just like paid everyone's bails is that were you part of that oh, the... he didn't he doesn't have my number i guess <laughs> Maybe that was only for Colombian people. I was just bandwagoning. I just followed. You know, I saw a bunch of people climbing a ladder, and I said, oh, let me go there. That seems fun. Yeah. Yeah, this this AV, AC vent seems cozy. Anyway. Uh, I'm not sure if Mateus was talking or if he no, was cutting out like a robot. It's all good. Um, well, Mateus, hopefully your Wi-Fi doesn't shit out like it did last week. Um, let's, uh, let's get into the show by talking about, uh, U.S. Women's National Team won Mexico nil, um, in one of two warm-up matches for the Olympics. The other is being played uh, an hour after we record. In about 30, um, in about 30 minutes. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Uh, so while we were recording this, most likely, um, Emily, you were at the game. Um, you got to experience it in all of the heat filled glory of a New Jersey afternoon. Um, what'd you think? Yeah. Other than the heat, you know, um, it was, it was an interesting game. I think like if I were to take this separate from there being an Olympics, you know, in like 10 days, and if I were just like, okay, this is the second window Emma Hayes has had with these players, I'd be like, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, positive things to take. Looks like we're stepping the wrong direction or right direction. Um, but there is an Olympics in 10 days and I'm now beginning to adjust expectations. And I think I've had a hard time reconciling, like knowing how much talent there is in this group and then like, what can they do with that in this very short amount of time that they've had together? Um, because even, like, if you think about the World Cup roster, a lot of these players were not on that either. So this is a very new group. So the game itself, I think uh, you could see a lot of, like, misconnections. A lot of, like, you know, almost um, not finding each other. Just being off kind of a little bit. Um That was definitely the first half. And they were playing super direct as well. Not very patient. Um, Which I didn't love. A bunch of balls over the top. That didn't go anywhere. Um, But second half, the positive thing is, is that that front three, um, they did connect together, each of them, on that goal. So that's very positive that the goal we scored saw some fluid buildup between them. Um, yeah, it's, I I think maybe I have a different perspective because I didn't watch the game. I wasn't able to watch it and I just watched <laughs> I highlights. I have a different perspective because I didn't watch the game. Yeah. Well, like, <laughs> obviously, obviously when you watch yeah. highlights, you're going to get a little bit of a different perspective, but yeah. I, when, it, what I saw from watching highlights was that we created a lot of chances and weren't able to put them away. Yeah. Um, which given... Like, we know what this team is capable of in terms of scoring. That doesn't worry me all that much in a warm-up game. If we get to the Olympics and that's still an issue, then it's an issue. But, like, we know that Trinity Rodman, Sophia Smith, and Mallory Swanson can score score goals. That is a given about all three of them um, and many other players on this team as well. So the fact that we won 1-0 and it was off a really nice goal from Sophia Smith, 
uh, but we created a lot of chances and and had a lot of opportunities that we should have scored. And I think on a normal day we put away. I don't know if it like the scoreline on its own worries me all that much, but do you mm-hmm. think there was a lot of just disconnect in the way they play? And do you think that is uh, like the lineup just came out for this this uh, last uh, warm up game, and the lineup is almost exactly the same, other than Crystal Dunn coming at left back? Uh, do you think that like I, I think it's pretty clear that Emma Hayes has found her starting lineup. Like yeah. th- there's not a lot of tweaks from here, a uh, uh, bar injuries. Um, so like, it's a good time for them to be messing up and to just still be finding that chemistry. Uh, but do you think it's like Emma Hayes has set her lineup and she's like, this is, these are the 12 players that I know will be starting games, um, at, at certain points. And I want them all to be on the same page. No, I think that's it. And I do think, I do think a lot of the misconnection is just a product of building that chemistry um, in the last game. I just, I just know that we have it's such a short tournament to be able to do that, and every group is stacked, you know. So you got to win that first game. We're playing Zambia, which maybe in prior years, prior tournaments, that would have been more of a gimme game. But with they've got Barbara Banda, and we know <laughs> what she can do with you know just a couple opportunities. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no time to waste. Um, we need to figure things out quickly. So I'm just doing some psychological, emotional adjustment just for my own personal well being. But, um, I do think, uh, Emma is trying to see, uh, this, this lineup gel and is kind of mimicking, um, the Olympics timing. You know, we just played like three days ago. That's how fast these, um, games are going to come in the Olympics. So I think she just wants to get that rhythm down. Just ch- just posing a question here for you guys. Like we're talking about the inability to finish chances against Mexico and for this team going forward trying to gel. Are we worried about the lack of I, I know Mitch we're talking about like Smith and Swanson and Rodman all goal scores, but are any of them like nines? Like right? Sophia Smith is. Well, yes, mm-hmm. but like Sophia Smith Sophia Smith, if like, is she like your out and out nine that's going to replace those Alex Morgan type goals? Like we saw that even though she hasn't, or Alex Morgan like wasn't on fire for club forever in terms of like you know like maybe we underrate her performance for a bit. Then she came back and had a rebirth with the national team, sort of filling in that nine role. Is that how much of a vacuum is that? Is Sophia Smith really going to fill it? Because she's she's more of a, a player with the ball at her feet, right, dribbling with it in that kind of vein of a nine, do we have like a fox in the box? Or not that we have a fox in the box, but are we going to be missing that? Like I think of my own Brazil men's experience where we don't have that out now that we have a ton of attacking talent, right? But like the having that lack of a focal point is a really big issue. Um, I do think Lynn Williams, who is now on the full roster, her best position is probably in the nine spot, even though you don't see that a lot um, at club at this point. She is more of a nine, and um, she can be clinical in the box, um, and she just does so much other stuff for you. But I'm not that worried about that. I just think we have different profile players, and I think Emma's smart enough to play to their strengths. Um, and I think they can be very dynamic and hopefully soon lethal together. Um, but... I mean, it would be nice to have that kind of profile, but with 18 players on a roster, um, we can't have, you know, every type of player that, that we'd want. Yeah, I, I think that Lynn adds an interesting profile that, like, will be very nice to have off the bench for games. Like, 100% you want your most dynamic athletes out there every single, like, and our, our best three attacking players. Um and if we get to a point in these games where we're struggling to score chances, having someone like Lynn Williams that can go into that nine spot and score goals will be really, really effective. Because, I mean, someone like Trinity Rodman, I've I've been a little critical of her when we talked about NWSL because I think that she gets a lot of chances that she doesn't finish. But mm-hmm. that is definitely not an issue that uh, uh, in Mallory Swanson and Sophia Smith's game. Uh, I, obviously, like, they're not fox in the boxes. They're more ball at their feet kind of players. But... That's not necessarily an issue. I, I think that we, when you have players like that, you just need to change the way you play. So that's why you have you have creators that will get the ball to their feet and not spam crosses. 
Um, mm-hmm. And so um, hopefully it, it works out. Uh, we'll see, obviously, with the send-off game tonight, if, like, we see more of the same issues, maybe it's time to sound the alarm a little bit. But Yeah, um, I do think Costa Rica is going to be – probably a a lesser opponent than Mexico were as well so but they'll probably play a deep block too so that poses a different challenge a whole different thing to break down and it's something that this team needs to know how to do uh I I I do think that I want to harp on the lineup thing for a second that I Mm -hmm. fully think Emma Hayes is found her starting lineup the midfield has been a conversation that we've had over the last few months and I think it's fully Lindsay Horan, Sam Coffey and Rose Lavelle will be the starters uh, I think it's tough for Jaden Shaw, but like we talked about it last week and we we're talking about the San Diego wave, like y- even someone as good as Jaden Shaw hasn't been lighting the world on or like hasn't been as good for club this season. Uh, and, and part of that might be just dysfunctions with the club, but um, Rose Lavelle's played really well. And if she's healthy, I'm all uh, okay with her starting. Um, I think this midfield's pretty balanced. Um, Sam Coffey has been very, very important for this team. Like, Ever since the World Cup, I think she's basically been, been undroppable for this team um, in, in important matches. And uh, I'm excited to see how the team does in the World Cup, and hopefully they can finish their chances. Uh, any last words on the U.S. Women's National Team, Emily, before we move on to MLS? Uh, just one word for Kat Macario. Just like how much, how absolutely, how much it sucks that, uh, yet again, she has to pull out um, – of this tournament. Um, you know, we've been waiting to see her on the international stage um, forever. You know, she had to wait to get her citizenship to like, um, you know, properly uh, become available for us. Um, and, you know, we've heard how incredible she could be, but we just haven't seen it yet. And I hope we do get to see it um, soon. It's just yep. sad. For sure. Missed opportunity um, to get to see her play in the on a big stage with the national team. Um, let's move on to MLS. Um, and before we get into the games, uh, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, which is talking about jerseys <laughs> um, and uh, being mad at MLS about it. Uh, like, and, and yeah, this is going to sound salty, and it's because it is. I want to be very clear that I'm being very petty and selfish and uh salty about this and it's uh mls released the archive collection today um five third kits for mls teams uh is portland uh la galaxy skc lafc and inner miami um they are all gorgeous jerseys they all look so cool all five of them are incredible and it just pisses me off. <laughs> um, and, like, yeah, most of it is jealousy. I'm not going to, like, lie to you guys and say that, like, oh, I'm mad just, like, oh, it's whatever. Uh, like, I'm mostly mad because the Rapids weren't one of the five. I wouldn't be as loud about this if the Rapids were one of the five. But the fact that, like, teams like LAFC and Inter Miami that have only – that have been around for less than 10 years were passed up or, or like, got these, like, throwbacks in favor of, uh, uh, like – over teams like DC United or Colorado or Seattle, which is celebrating a 30th anniversary this year, um, it is frustrating to see. And it, it's 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 how MLS does their third kits, which is it's based on jersey sales, which is stupid. Uh, like it's it's just dumb. It means that like a smaller market team like Colorado, because like yeah, we're not going to sell as many Mahalovich jerseys as Miami is selling Messi jerseys. I know that. But, like, it, it also means that, like, oh, we, we're just not going to bother. And I think it's just, like, a bad message to send to a lot of teams. Because, like, it, just because the jersey sales for a team like Colorado isn't as high for a team like LAFC doesn't mean that people don't care about the team and don't want to see a third kit or another thing. I would happily spend over $200 on a third kit and, and like, the custom, like, uh, g- gazelles that they're selling. I would buy some burgundy gazelles 100%. Those what are gazelles? so sick. I don't know. It's the, uh, like, shoes. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, they all look dope, and I'm jealous, oh and I'm God. mad about how MLS does third kits. Uh, and that's the end of my rant. We're going to talk about the games now. I would buy a Metro Stars jersey. Just saying. Yeah. Exactly. That'd be rad as hell. Uh, also, these jerseys don't have sponsors. Like, they have sponsors on, like, the back of them, and it just says the name, which 
makes them even fucking cooler. And uh, I'm, I feel robbed uh, because the Rapids have such great throwback kits to work with, and a modern version of them would look very cool, and I'm mad about it. Uh, anyway, let's get into the games. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, New England Revolution 1, Orlando 3. Mateus, what did you think? Um, yeah, like, so, Orlando City was stinky for a whole lot of the season, and now they're firing again, mostly because they played Martin Ojeda in his natural position, and Facundo Torres on the right-hand side of the field, breaking cut in on his left foot. And the recipe wasn't really that hard, right? It was, um, going to a single striker, Luis Muriel hasn't been the most amazing DP signing. Doug McGuire's a little hurt now, so Ramon Enrique started this game, but uh, Oscar Prey has always played a 4-2-3-1, and trying to fit two strikers has just not been the experiment this season that, that you know they expected it to and, and not worked out after the Duncan McGuire transfer failure. And you, you know, just, just going back to what works has caused this team to kind of resurge. Um, New England opened the scoring with like kind of a, a dumpy goal by uh, Vrioni. Uh, Dejuan Jones at the back post um, squared it back to the penalty spot. Vrioni scored a tap in. Um, but then the two Ramon or er, the two Facundo Torres goals um, after halftime were just like he's wide open on the left hand side. He's got a beautiful right or er, left foot. He's just gonna curl it around the keeper, um, around Ivicic. Like no chance of stopping it. And it makes you wonder why this move wasn't made earlier in, earlier in the season. Um, also, Martino Hayda is just miles better than Lico Lodero. And the fact that he had to play a nine or try to avoid that 10 spot is really ridiculous. Um, but a smooth win for Orlando. Um, the Revs, other than that tap in goal that they scored, never really looked super duper threatening. Um, I thought Hannah U2 had a pretty decent game. Um, another young guy. Uh, I think he's probably 20 or 21 now, but a youth team player from, from the Revs. And obviously, Barak has been a good player for them for most of the season. Um, but but yeah, like a nice away win for Orlando and finally getting back in the form. Maybe, I'm not, let me see where they're at the table if they're in the playoff line. So yeah, they, they can climb up the table. They're in seventh right now. So a big win for them, I think, on the road. Yeah, I think it strikes me as like a, like a manager's for, hand being forced with Duncan McGuire being gone for the Olympics of like, okay, now you have only one striker. You have to go back to how you want to play rather than trying to cookie cutter this. Which, and I wonder if this, if especially if they go on a good form during the Olympics, if it changes their selling position on Duncan, Duncan McGuire, which seems to have changed based on reports, is that like they all of a sudden don't want to sell him and he really wants to leave. He doesn't want to sign a new contract. He wants to go to Europe. Um, and I think he deserves to go to Europe, especially after his deal collapsed. Um, and hopefully, like, hopefully it works out for all parties where Orlando can pick up form. Luis Muriel can start playing it like a DP and Duncan McGuire has a good Olympics. His stock rises once again, and they're able to sell him to Europe. Um, but it might be a best case scenario where Duncan's gone and, and they're able to find some form. Um, let's move on now, uh, to a little bit of a surprising result, which was a since he won Charlotte three. What'd you think, Emily? Yeah, I actually turned this game on when it was, I, I got home from the U.S. Women's Deaf Team match, and I said, what MLS game am I going to watch? And I saw that it was 2-0 to zero, uh, uh, Charlotte, and I said, there's no way that this game is going to end 2-0, <laughs> so I turned that on. Um, I kind of thought at that point that, like, there's a very good chance Cincinnati turns it around and wins this game. Uh, and it was looking that way. They were able to get it go back before halftime. And then probably the huge inflection point here of, like, that not happening, them not getting a result, was um, uh, Lucio miss or his penalty was saved by Kalina. Um, and then about two minutes later, Orjano thinks he's also equalized. And that goal is called back for um, an offside. So it's just like that happening must deflate a team so much to think that you're about to like equalize twice and then it's all crumbled. And truly minutes later, um, Charlotte kills the game with a third goal. Um, although Miles Robinson actually killed the game <laughs> with a Doxa red card. Uh, so after that, there was really no going back for Cincinnati. Um, but credit to Charlotte because they look very strong. Um, going into this latter half of the season, um, a uh, man of the match performance from Ashley Westwood. He had three assists. Could have had a fourth, um, 
if this uh, fourth goal they had scored off a corner hadn't been called back for offside as well. So I'm like, yeah, you know, who knows what they're going to do in the playoffs, but you probably wouldn't want to draw them. Um, I think they're going to be really hard to beat. Yeah, um, impressive win from them, uh, and and not a great one from Cincy after coming off of destroying Inter Miami yeah. last week. Yeah, and this is at home too. So yeah, uh, and and anytime you miss multiple chances that are clear cut, it's always going to be demoralizing or just like having a goal called back. Um, moving on now, uh, the Rapids hosted the Red Bulls in Colorado this weekend uh, to a nice little one-one draw. The 2024 New York Red Bulls continue to prove that they can and will draw with you uh, no matter what the situation. Uh, they have the most draws in MLS with 10. Um, and uh, this was, I don't know, it was kind of a nothing game. Uh, like it, 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 there really wasn't all that much in this game that is that all that interesting. I'm more interested in looking forward to next week for the Rapids. Uh, well, I guess this week in general, we have two games. We play a Wednesday game in Galaxy, and then uh, we have the culmination of the Rocky Mountain Cup this weekend, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. And Real Salt Lake will be without uh, Chicho, which is fucking mm. huge, um, especially because we're out without Jordy, who's away with the Olympics. Um, but I think that, like, I've spoke very highly of Chris Armas and the job that he has done in Colorado this year. And... I think that there's nothing more that he could do to truly endear himself to the fans this season. Winning a Rocky Mountain Cup in your first season would would absolutely do that. It's been a it's been a long time since we've won a Rocky Mountain Cup and an opportunity to do that in your first season as manager would be absolutely massive, especially with RSL being as good as they are this season. Um I'm bringing seven friends to the game. I'm hoping that it's going to be a good one. I'm very excited. The the club should start paying me to be an ambassador at this point. It's unbelievable that I'm doing this for free. Can I get tips on how to talk seven? I would just like to get, like, one friend to like soccer. I, to be fair, this is like a big opportunity. Like I'm like praying for it to not be a nil nil draw and for it to be a good game because these are all people that like, will see me watching a Rapids game in a bar and they're like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, So I'm just like, hey, you guys want to go to a Rapids game? And a bunch of people said yes. So I'm just like, okay, great, let's go. Um, So hopefully it's a good experience. Hopefully they have a good time. Hopefully the Rapids win. That's what I'd like. (laughs) Mitch doubling the Rapids fan base in one day. It's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, instead of the regular 12 people, there's going to be 20. So it's going to be, it's going to be good. Let's go. (laughs) Um, so looking forward to that and hopefully celebrating, uh, a Rocky mountain cup victory. That would be absolutely lovely. Um, we're going to move on now to Dallas Two galaxy nil. Mateus, what is going on in LA? Yeah, I, I saw the score, Mitch, and I was like, I got to watch this. Some shit ain't right. Like this isn't, this isn't right. Um, because the galaxy don't have a lot of players away on international duty, right? They just got Jalen Neal back, um, not too long ago. So Pants is still there, Gabriel Petch is still there, Fungunas is still there. Like, what? what's happening? Um, like, and it was interesting because this game, they, they held a lot of possession. And FC Dallas, ever since they fired Nico Estevez, playing the same formation, but have kind of had a new manager bounce with Peter Luchin, um, have kind of just been showing more effort in their games. Petr Musa started scoring, putting the ball in the net. I think he has six in the past seven games. Um, they uh, just absorbed a lot of pressure from, from the Galaxy. And who who didn't have like any shots? I think they were just trying to pass the ball into the box, play cutesy soccer, um, and sort of work their way the ball to the box. And it wasn't happening. They were, I think they had two shots in the box all game. Um, and FC Dallas just kept hitting them on the counter. I think at, at halftime while watching this game, like you got the feeling that the Galaxy were frustrated and didn't really know what to do because Dallas had numbers back, so the counter wasn't working, and in possession they weren't getting any joy. Um, Peter Musa scores one in the 28th minute. Rockets went in off a deflection from a Logan Farrington shot. Farrington gets one of his own in the 55th minute. And I think the, after that 55th minute goal, like nothing happened. Literally nothing happened for both teams. A dead quiet second half. So it was just kind of an easy defensive win for Dallas. Galaxy looked like hungover. There was times in the first half where they would put on like a really good counter press for like 30 seconds. And then they were just like jog walking the rest of the time. So it's just kind of away from home. Um, 
long stretch of games. I think maybe just heavy legs and a couple injuries to Brugman and Jovalic kind of put them down, but they really weren't up for this game. Um, Dallas, I think, with a deserved 2 0 win, even if against like a kind of um, neutered Galaxy side, so to speak. Well, I hope the Galaxy continue that form this week when they play the Rapids. <laughs> uh, Emily, uh, what did you think about uh, Portland's demolition of Real Salt Lake? Yeah, I, I was. was- I was in a bar during this game, and I was, like, seeing Portland goals, and I'm like, what is happening? Because I wasn't able to watch. I was far enough away where I wasn't watching the game, but I was like, I'm loving what I'm seeing in RSL losing. I was going to say, you're going to want them, you know, in the form that they were in in that game when you meet them (laughs) in the Rocky Mountain Cup, because they had absolutely nothing for Portland that night. I think, like, three shots on target um, all night. Uh, I I didn't know... I like I don't think I've watched a Portland game since like nearly the beginning of the season. So even though we did a mid season review last week, I didn't know that they were like above the playoff line. Um and watching them I see why. Like that front four and I had seen it earlier, but that front four is just like so dynamic and fun. And they were just taking it to RSL uh like again and again all game. For that the second goal is like so beautiful. They were just Hanging it around the box until um, Moreno was set up for a half volley finish. Um, it was sick, um, but they were all involved, you know, all game. All of them looked dangerous. Um, I think Eric Lampson also had a low key, really good game. He was making like a lot of those key passes um, to break the lines. Um, I just, I'm going to continue to watch them, even though I kind of have a Phil Neville bias, so I kind of stay away. But I might, I might start yeah. watching the Timbers a little bit more. You know, when Phil Neville uh, refuses to give you any sort of instructions on the pitch, it allows for a lot of free, fl- uh, free flowing dynamic, free flowing football. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, fluid dynamic soccer. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like we've been on the record for having Phil Neville agendas on this podcast. And so we've, like, especially since we, like, switched formats fully this season of, like, not covering every single game, Portland has been a team that's kind of flown under the radar. But they've been really, really solid. Like, Evander has 21 goals and assists this season. Solid is not really the word I would use for that defense, though, is the thing. Right? They score a lot. They also concede a lot. Yes, I, I have watched them in person against Columbus, and they scored a lot, but they also conceded a lot. <laughs> it's, a, it's a recipe um, for, for my enjoyment, you know? It's a recipe for neutral enjoyment, which yeah. we can all appreciate as somewhat neutrals about Portland, even though we're a little bit of haters about their coats. <laughs> um, let's uh, move on now to um, a repeat of last year's MLS Cup Final, which is Crew and LAFC. And it went exactly how you'd expect with the crew <laughs> winning 5-1. Um, I do think this is very funny that these are the two coaches that, whose names have probably come up the most within a U.S. men's national team context uh, since Greg Berhalter is uh, getting fired. Um, Steve Chirondolo being a very popular name when it comes to uh, an American that can take over. Um, and Wilford Nancy showed him the fuck up uh, in this game. Um, just as he did in the MLS Cup final. Uh, I was thinking, because I'd, I'd seen all these Columbus goals on Twitter, all five of them are sick, every single one of them. They're all great goals. Um, and I was like, something had to have gone wrong. I look, there's three red cards in this game. Okay, so surely it was like a close game, and then LAFC got a red card, and then the wheels came off. They were down 3-0 before they went down to 10 men, and it didn't happen until like the 80th minute or something like that. Um, so... No, Columbus is just straight up fucking better. Uh, this was in LA too. Uh, they truly, truly just went to their house and smashed the shit out of them. Um, it's ballers, fuck. I love this Columbus crew team. I love Wilford Nancy. I love Cucho. Like it, it, it this rules. It, it, it fucking rules. It's great. <laughs> Real quick, gut check, Mitch, for the two coaches. Uh, which uh, response to the U.S. men's national team job posting do you like better? I really um, hated uh, Trundolo's. Yeah, Ch- Chirundolo's gremlin little, I am currently the coach. I'm going in tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Or uh, <laughs> Wilfred Nancy <laughs> talking about how limitless he is and how he's always willing to push himself forward. I did not see the Nazi comments, but I did see Trondolos, who was not a fan. But, like, 
That's such a fucking Frenchman answer, and I love it. I think the fact that like my two guys that I want for the U.S. men's national team job are Herb Vernard or Wilfred Nancy is like uh, maybe I just want the U.S. to be French. Uh, maybe I just want that. Um, and um, so let's hope the U.S. men's national team hires a French guy. Please. <laughs> Let's uh let's move on to the last game that we are covering this week, which is Toronto FC two Philly one. We almost had a fourteen year old come on this uh, come into this game, but those those Canadians with their stupid labor laws prevented us. This is Poor unbelievable. Shame. Hey, but I, I don't know if you heard the news. He's on the bench tonight, as a matter of fact. Yes. Tomorrow night, he's on the bench officially. Kevin Sullivan on the bench um, for Philadelphia Union, fourteen years old. Um, like Mitch said, didn't. Uh, get on the bench of this game because of Canadian labor laws. So he traveled <laughs> along with a bench full of children and CJ only Raffinello has gotten some games, Makanya. Anyway, um, Mitch, uh, these two teams stunk, have been stinking for a long time. Um, earlier in the season, uh, I said erroneously that Toronto FC stunk and you guys were like, wait, they're fourth in the East. Well, they have two points in their last nine games. So I, I think don't I was right the that. whole time. Don't attribute they're those still in the playoffs. to me. They're still in the playoffs right now. <laughs> Two points from their last nine games. Also a loss to Forge FC in the Canadian Championship semifinals recently. Um, which is fucking hey, they're a great team. They're great. I watch a lot of Forge FC. And, and let me tell you, they're a real good team. <laughs> but the thing is, Philly isn't even any better. They have two points in their last eight games. Um, and a lot more draws before then. They're way further down the table than even Toronto is. Um, so this is about to be a, a heavyweight battle, uh, too. Especially with Karanza gone. Um, Philadelphia is last in the East right now. That's yeah. fucking crazy. Well, the, part of the reason <laughs> I did not know I, that was true. Part of the reason <laughs> I think they're they're promoting not promoting full time, but uh, Kevin Kevin on the bench, CJ Olden who's another big time prospect on the bench, is because they're like, hey, these kids are sixteen and they're like as good as your Kevin's like fourteen, and they're like they're knocking on your door, so like you guys better sh- like shut the fuck up and start playing, um, because despite the lack of investment in this roster, like you guys are adults, right? Um, Talbaritabo, who was like, like I said, a human victory candle at certain points of the season, is now a starter. Like it's looking bad, um, uh, especially up front for the Philadelphia Union. Um, they got a goal from Talbaritabo from a header crossed in from Kai Wagner on the on the, the left hand side um, for uh, for their opening goal, opening salvo in Toronto, one 0 Philadelphia Union, and then Toronto FC just kind of had the bulk of the possession going the other way for the rest of the match. They scored on a lovely cross field ball from uh, Bernadeschi hits uh, well it, it's credited as an Elliot own goal but it was DeAndre Kerr with the finish and Kerr strikes again um, from a through ball also on the left hand side puts it past the 18 year old goalie Andrew Rick they're really committed to the kids in Philadelphia now um, with Andre Blake injured and Shemla not performing super well um, yeah just they, they kind of dropped the ball the second half pretty badly and just kind of let Toronto um, back into this game I think with just like a little bit of the energy from the home crowd, honestly, they're kind of feeding off of. But class kind of shows Bernadeschi had a really nice game. Um, and Sydney had a couple of moments in the first half, didn't get on the score sheet at all. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know. It's really, really quite ugly in Philadelphia nowadays. Um, and it's it's really relying on the academy to pull something out because some investment needs to be made pretty urgently. I will say that one of the exciting things about having a bad team is that the kids get more chances. Uh, w- one thing that helped Arsenal's rebuild was someone like Bukayo Saka coming into the team for the first time. And, and it's Amiel always Smith nice seeing the academy. Rest Ooh. in peace to Emil Smith Rowe. Enjoy Fun. Fulham. That is all for us this week for the soccer edition. Uh, Adidas, please give me a Rapids throwback. Peace. <laughs> I'll take a fail Harbor 10. Bye. Take a shot. Take a shot.